Hi, this is Michael Feigen. Welcome back, or welcome for the first time if you didn't watch part one. This is part two of Processing Trademarks at the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. So uh, my name, just as a quick bio while well, you heard my name, but again, it's Michael Feigen. Um, website is patentlawny.com. I am a partner at the law firm of Feigen and Friedman, and we handle patents, trademarks, copyrights, other intellectual property matters. Um, feel free to send me questions, uh, comments, whatever it is on this video or the prior video. I'm happy to answer your further issues. And today, to get right into it, on the first slide, you'll see this is the trademark timeline that is from my website, again, at patentlawny.com or patentlawnj.com if you prefer. And uh, this goes through the process of obtaining a trademark. And in part one, we discussed searches and f how to fill out the forms to file the trademark application. And now in part two, we touched on this a little, but today we're really going to start with responding to office actions. That is, once the U.S. Trademark Office comes back and examines your trademark that typically happens about four months after filing and they reject it or give you issues, what do you do then? Um, in general, and if you see on the trademark timeline, there's actually an upper right hand corner is already part one. The video is uh, up there on the timeline and we'll be adding part two after this is done, of course. And uh, otherwise we would have a temporal problem doing that if I tried to do it now. But in any case, in part two, we're going to discuss now the four months on this timeline when the trademark office rejects your trademark, what do you do? In general, a trademark office is pretty easy to work with. You just have to know the rules and usually what they say makes sense. And in my experience, I file a lot of international trademarks as well. United States is the most, I want to say, um, requiring of rules to be followed, require the goods and services to be listed a certain way, and that sort of thing, more so than I think most other countries. But on the other hand, they are the most lenient with allowing things to be registered. Trademarks such as uh, Life Locator or buy a, buy a Bridge or whatever, these sort of things which are descriptive, in Europe you don't stand a chance of getting them allowed. But in the United States, they say, hey, no problem, we'll allow those descriptive supplemental register, which was discussed in the last one, that we'll discuss also today when we get to supplemental register, U.S. Trademark Office is pretty good about allowing those sort of marks. So let's go into the first one. Then the first topic we're going to talk about is refusal for surnames. These aren't so common. They do happen. I just find them sort of fun ones. So I thought we're going to start with something light today, and we're going to start with a surname refusal. So you see over here, we have a trademark office action for the trademark is felt, F-E-L-T-T, -T, two T's. This, I received a rejection from the trademark office because they said this is merely a surname. You cannot register a trademark which is merely a surname. You can't register a trademark which is offensive. That's currently one of my colleagues is currently just took that to the Supreme Court. You can't register trademarks for all sorts of reasons. The Supreme Court is currently deciding if, so this might be outdated depending on the, how the Supreme Court rules, but currently you can't register trademarks if the trademark office says you can't, if there's a statute that says you can't, or even if there's a practice that says you can't. So one of these practices, which has come out of case law, is that you can't register just a last name. Because I guess the idea, the idea in theory is a good one, I think, because they don't want you saying, well, uh, there's a, a ton of John Smiths in the world. We don't want you registering a trademark for Smith. Who says you get that over anyone else? You want to register her first and last name together? No problem. Do that all the time. I'll show you one of those coming up. But this one felt they said is a last name, which... It doesn't take a lawyer to know who who is John Felt, who is Tom Felt, who are these people? Have you ever seen someone named Felt? So I went and looked it up, and sure enough, Felt is a last name for like 300 people in the country. Who knew? I believe it was with one T, uh, not two. And they said, well, close enough. And you say, well, 
wait a minute, but it's got another word to it. It's got another, felt has another meaning. And so you see here, they said, what are the, the, the five things in the surname? Is it rare? Would anyone connected with the applicant use the term as a surname? Does it have a recognized meaning other than? And so forth. And the interesting case law I find here even more interesting. Pickett, they decided was a surname, because even though it had another meaning. But then there's another one, Kahan. They decided, oh, Kahan is not, that's registrable. Which, uh, Kahan, to me, that's like a cl clear surname. I mean, maybe this was a Protestant judge in o Oklahoma who had never met, met a Kahan. I think there's, whatever, I've met plenty of them. Kahan, Kohen, and so forth. You could say, well, that has another meaning. It just means priest in Hebrew and so forth. Uh, and that one was found registrable. There's no real consistency. And the case law will say, oh, well, look, there's uh, this number of people and so forth. So when I go and argue these in the next slide, you see the response to the office action. I went and argued this and said, well, let's look it up. You can look up places like... Uh, um, PBS has a thing for searching last names, and I searched the last names there, and there's other websites which have things such as how common are words, um, I don't see the thing here, but <coughs> how common are words, and you can just do uh, Google searches for how, how common are different words. In the English language, we'll say, hey, this is pretty common, and I, I just gave a bunch of examples here. I was like, okay, Pirelli was not a last name, but someone registered who says, well, it sounds like a last name. And you see how crazy these arguments get. Felt, you can say, well, I felt sick today. I'm ma making a project made out of felt and so forth. No one's going to think, oh, I, um, I, I felt sick today. It's like, oh, really? The felt family reunion was last week and the food was bad? Who's going to think that? So that was actually the kind of argument I made here. And you can see all the lists of names. Rogan is primarily a surname. Like, okay, we'll give you that one, because, you know, Seth Rogan is kind of famous, and who's ever heard of anything else? I don't know, Rogan Josh is an Indian food? I might have argued that. And I had another one, Zoni. It was Zoni Language Lab. It was just uh, using the first letters of each of the founders' last names. And the, tr the examiner actually called me up and said, well, Zoni is just a last name. I said, no, they made it up. Well, no, it's just a last name. But he actually came armed and said, well, it's also a soup in Japan, so if we we can amend the application and put that it's a soup in Japan, we'll allow the mark. Sure, whatever, a type of soup in Japan. Who knew? So we got that mark. All right, moving on to the next one. That That's uh, more than enough time spent on surname refusals. This is, the next one is hyperstacking <coughs> over here. And in this case, the we're moving in general from simple to more complex rejections. So... Right now, they're sort of trivial. Eventually, we're going to get to likelihood of confusion rejections, which are sort of the the hardest ones to overcome, the worst ones where they say it's confusingly similar to another mark. But here, on hyperstacking, what happened? Um, the examiner basically, you have to read between the lines on this. They want to know fact sheets, instruction manage brochures, uh, and this type, type of thing. They want to know information about what it is. And they ask these questions in bold here, number three on page two of the office action. Does hyperstacking describe a specific function of the goods? Do applicants and competitors use hyperstacking? Why? Because the examiner basically wants to know, are you trying to trademark a term that everyone is using? If everyone's using, you can't get it. The whole idea of a trademark is it creates secondary meaning. It creates another meaning to a word, whether that is the words existing or not. And said, so, no, this, this hyperstacking is a made-up word. In this case, hyperstacking was made up by my brother. My brother's uh, uh, company is uh, one of my clients. And so I was able to answer this and say, no, it's just a made-up term and so forth. It doesn't refer to specific goods. No one else uses this. Fine, you can register that. Where if you try and register a term where everyone is using, give you another example, I, had, um, I hadn't heard of this, and it was a case I took over from someone else. Stand-up paddleboard. Stand-up paddleboards are called SUPs. Someone, I don't remember the exact mark. It was something like good SUP. It sounds like, okay, we're having some good dinner. That's great. Let's have some good dinner with some zoni soup in it. And in, in such a case, you could register it for your good dinner, or SUP, perhaps. Actually, I'm sorry, no, you probably couldn't, because SUP stands for supper. In this case, it was stand-up paddleboard, so they didn't allow it. 
And so we were able to get that on the supplemental register because good sup, although it described it, it was like a good stand-up pedal board. You're just describing it. It's very descriptive in nature. There's no secondary meaning behind it. And I might say, hey, that's a good stand-up pedal board. You can't register that. But maybe it'll acquire secondary meaning. And something which is descriptive is not ordinarily registerable unless you're using it for five years or you ha or I should say usually five years, not always. You're using it for five years or you put lots of money behind it. I have another client who registers the patterns that she puts on her handbags. And the patterns on her handbags are not registerable because if you see a pattern on a handbag, unfortunately I have no props here to show you for a pattern for a handbag, but you see something like the outside of a Gucci bag where it's got the repeating G in a pattern, they were coach bags. They say that those are registrable because you recognize those as some, as a source of coming from Gucci or coming from coach. Whereas my client, I'm a two and a half person firm. I, I'm not s someone who gets these clients typically. Sometimes I do, but typically my clients aren't, aren't coach and that sort of thing. And so they're not spending $30 million in advertising behind this, so they register in the supplemental register. And when Coach registers them, they go and show, we spent $30 million in an ad campaign so people know this is a Coach bag. I don't know, but apparently other people do. Um, in fact, my client, I had one who registered what was a copy of a Gucci bag, got their goods seized by Gucci, but we had the trademark registration because I didn't know any better to know what, you know, it was even a problem because I didn't know what a Gucci bag looked like at the time. Um, and point being, we had the registration and that made her life a whole lot easier because we said, well, the government recognizes this as something different instead of a repeating pattern of whatever Gucci repeats in their pattern. I, don't remember. She had a repeating pattern of A's on it or something to that extent. So we'd say, well, it's different enough that it's registrable and it's recognized as not being a Gucci thing. And sometimes just having a trademark registration helps for things like Amazon now. It's common. Uh, I have whole articles on my website of dealing with Amazon. That's a whole nother ball game. Amazon's trying to clean up their act now, I see, but you have to deal with the Amazon intellectual property, whatever. I can give a whole hour talk on that. It's a problem. It's, they just, they just take people down left and right. Don't care. If someone raised an issue, we don't care. We take you off the seller marketplace and you were responsible for anything that happens on here, even if it's our fault, even if we put your product together with another product and it required those two products to infringe. Uh, then you're responsible. You have to pay damages. Even if you did, there's nothing. You had no control. Amazon totally did it. They don't care. Um, but point being, if you have a trademark registration, it makes it harder for others to take you down because say you're infringing upon their trademark and said, well, you have your trademark and it's recognized as separate, even if it's similar, even if you've never planned to use this trademark to assert against anyone, it's recognition from the government that your mark is registrable compared to these others. All right, moving on. Um, we're going to move on now to time to climb. We're going to get a little bit more difficult here. Uh, identification of services. So in this one, I had filed the mark for um, online journals, namely blogs featuring mountaineering, hiking, rock climbing, outdoor activity, Workshop for the Salmon of Fields, the Mountaineering, Hiking, Rock, Climbing, which, and you'll notice there is a slight typo there, which should have been caught by me, but if not by me, then uh, I, then my practice is I send these to clients and make them sign their marks. I don't sign their trademarks because if they say, hey, there's an error, you find something wrong, I'm like, well, didn't you read the application when you signed it? And half the time, I mean, who reads documents? But at least then it's not your fault. You're not hauled into court for testifying about alleging, for example, that they sold something at a certain date of use. How do you know that? Um, they actually signed it. It's their signature in the end. And so the examiner went and said, well, this needs to be amended. Usually they'll call you up. And they'll say rock climbing outdoor activities and corrected my spelling mistake. Or in the case where they don't like the list of goods for some reason, then they'll say it's too broad, too narrow compared to the specimen you submitted. Then you can um, uh, amend here. Typically, 
Um, most people today, I think it's upwards of 80%, file using the trademark classification manual. I went through that in part one, and you select goods out of there. However, in this case, where the error cropped in was I select, with some of them you can select where it's open ended, where in this case I had selected a blogs featuring, and there's a blank. What is a blog feature? So I entered the data, and that's where the error creeped in. Um, if you do free form, sometimes you have to do this because you can't find goods in the manual. Then sometimes they don't like like what you did, and you have to amend to the other things. You can only amend the goods after you file. The goods can only be narrowed; they can't be broadened in scope. But for infringement, it's likelihood of confusion anyway. So if I put online blogs featuring mountaineering only, and someone else has one featuring hiking. That's probably still infringing if it's also time to climb. So whether I add hiking or not isn't really that 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 much of a difference, uh, and so forth. If I had just online blogs and I left it blank, I would have gotten a rejection. You need to add something. Probably depending on the examiner, I could add featuring mountaineering, and that's going to be more narrow. So because that's that that's that would narrow it, and whatever anyone else who has a blog called Time to Climb is probably still infringing in any case. All right, next one, calendar with a K. This one, I had counseled the client, don't do it, you don't want to file this. She said, here's my money, I want you to file this. I said, okay, because, you know, when, when, you know, someone throws money at you, what do you say? No, I'm not going to take your money. There are cases where I do that where it's just so bad. But in this case, you know, whatever, I had written to her, I had to make sure to put it in writing, then I had to make sure that she responded to that email. So some, some attorneys would have them sign a statement and that type of thing, make sure they sign it. But my, my general practice is I put it in email, I might put it in the email that has the link to view the trademark application. So there's no way they can say they didn't get that email. I said, I, I think this is going to be a problem. And in fact, this was what happened here. Trademark office said this is merely descriptive, and why? Because it was calendar. What was it for? It was calendar for um, promoting the goods and service others by, by means of distributing advertising on the internet. So I had given it a good try. I put in goods that not re as far away from calendaring things as possible. There were other goods that were suggested to me by the client that were that were even closer. In this case, I had said uh, by means of dist distributing advertising on the internet. So it's not clear that we're talking about a calendar itself. Um, but even so, we still got the rejection, and the rejection was it was merely descriptive. And the client elected not to respond to this, but I would have responded with arguments saying otherwise, saying, well, it's not clear that this is uh, this is referring to calendaring services, but, uh, and I would have made those arguments. And, and I don't know, maybe I could have gotten through, uh, but if you notice, there is an inquiry here again, just like in the hyperstacking, this is on page five of the office action. It says, give us fact sheets, give us uh, other materials. Does the examiner contain and cooperate calendars or use calendars in, in the process of this? And practically speaking, when you're talking about goods which are um, related to uh, goods and services of others, that if you're talking about goods, you can say, okay, it's not a calendar, but then why would you register the trademark calendar for it? Maybe you would. You're probably talking about concerts are at a certain date, rent a hotel a certain date. That's where it's probably going to involve calendars. And the examiner sort of, you know, we did the best we could. The examiner saw through this. Maybe in a response we could have gotten through this with arguments otherwise to say, no, no, we're not using calendars and that sort of thing. You notice the spelling difference doesn't really matter. In general, spelling differences are discounted by the trademark office, as are... Um, as our translations and those sort of things, translations sometimes help. We'll get to that a little bit later. If, in other words, if you file it in a foreign language, does the English translation matter? Yes, it does, but they'll say it does, but there's times when you can finagle your way out of that because it's in a translation. Uh, okay, next one was thermal insulation. So in this case, thermal insulation 
was it was refused because it was descriptive, but we could get it on the supplemental register. So in this case, therm thermal insulation, we have here, um, it was a logo type mark. So the, the logo is not here. I'm sorry about that. But you can always look up the trademark if you want. It was a logo around it. It was a certain black and white sort of type of mark that he was going to put. If you see on the, the end of gloves, sometimes you see a little thing that says Gore-Tex or whatever. That's a trademark. Um, this was thermal insulation, that sort of thing he'll put here. And it had a stylized logo. It's a square with black and white letters written on it. That was enough to get it on the supplemental register. Supplemental register, if you didn't watch part one or are unfamiliar, is where you get a registration, you get the R with the circle, but you don't get full full damages if someone infringes. It's akin to having a common law registration, except it's federal. Common law trademark means you haven't actually filed a trademark. Uh, you're just claiming rights by virtue of that this is your business name. I worked at a place for five years called Mars Plains Pharmacy, and it is a pharmacy in Mars Plains, New Jersey. And they, as far as I know, never registered a trademark, as do many small businesses. It's a single location pharmacy in the town of Mars Plains. You're not really worried about trademark infringement then until it happens. Someone else opens up a, because it has such a name for itself, this, this pharmacy has been around for, I don't know, close to 100 years. Uh, someone else opens up in, I don't know, in, uh, where am I? I'm in Clifton, New Jersey, a Mars Plains pharmacy trading off of that name. They probably wouldn't do that. Uh, the state of pharmacies is, unless you're a chain who's opening pharmacies today, but let's just say for the sake of argument, they do that then that might be trademark infringement because it's going to confuse people uh, due to common law because it's too close in proximity, too close of a name. <coughs> so it's a harder thing to prove and the damages are far, far less. Whereas if you are registered on the primary register, you now get statutory damages, which can be hundreds of thousands of dollars for infringing upon someone's trademark with the easier injunctions and that sort of thing. But here we got it at least on the supplemental. And if they used it for five years, then, uh, then after that five years of usage, then the registration would be uh, potentially on the primary register depending on how descriptive is descriptive. If it's ridiculously descriptive, then I've had them have cases where they say, nope, even after five years, not enough. But generally speaking, if there's something else there to it that we could argue is more of a difference, you, you can get it on the primary register at that point after five years of usage. That's the general rule, but not the hard and fast rule. Okay, next one is modal, and you'll see I have a picture here of modal, which is this pink thing with two different pink colors with this heart shape at the front. And what happened here when I filed modal? Basically here, this one is the examiner said, we don't like your description of the, of the mark. The description of the mark should be, it should say the color claim. The color is dark pink and light pink are claimed as a feature of the mark. I might have just put pink. I don't know. If it wasn't one of the original 16 colors in Windows 3.1, I haven't heard of it. So pink to me is pink. Uh, making a difference between dark pink and light pink is sure. I don't know. I'm sure they have more colors beyond that if you wanted to be more complicated. And the mark description. So... The examiner insisted on this description, as insisted, whatever, suggested, consists of the styling, styling, styled wording modal, where the letter M is formed of a dark pink heart and the letters odal are light pink with the O's filled in with dark pink. The color white represents background is not claimed as a feature of the mark. So these sort of things, when you get the description of the mark and color claim, this is only when you file logo type marks and they say it has to be uh, you have to have this description. You have to say what colors are used. That's really for the trademark office's benefits and people who want to search. If I'm want, going to file a trademark and I'm going to search for all the other marks which have pink hearts in them, which are related to the sale of, 
I don't know, the sale of, I'm trying to think of something where you might actually see, uh, gremlin dolls. How many gremlin dolls with pink hearts? There you might, if you find one, you might be concerned because you're not going to find too many. If you've had pink hearts on um, stationary, there you're going to find tons of them. So there your search is probably useless and as long, you're going to find so many. But in any case, it's for the point of searching. These things don't really matter um, to the person filing them. Maybe some argument made in court about infringement. See, the trademark office calls it dark pink and they have dark pink. I don't know. Um, but the description of the mark, it doesn't really matter. But you must put it there. You must, when you file the trademark, put it there or they charge you a $50 fee for not putting it there and then having to put it there later. So you, you try your best with it. They don't really matter. In some of my applications now where I know, like trying to describe this thing, so back to the Modal logo, this one is somewhat easy to describe. Some of them are these ridiculously complicated logos where it's like concentric circles and different shapes and shading and raindrops of different colors and some things overlay others and some things don't and there's changing colors and gradients you make your best effort and in those cases sometimes i just put on the application itself examiners given pre-authorization to make an amendment to the color claim and description of the mark because i don't care sometimes examiners call me up and they say to me Okay, we, they, they make it all formal. Okay, do you need the name of this mark? Do you need your docket number? Yeah, sure. What is it? Half the time, just like, tell me the name of the mark. Hopefully, I remember it. It was only four months ago. Sometimes I don't. Usually, I do. And they say, it's color claim. And they're, okay, we need to amend this. We need to just consistent to comprising in light blue, dark blue, and this thing. And should I fax you the list or email you the, the, the description that I have? And it's this, like, eight-line description. And typically, I just say, I don't care. Whatever you want, fine. And they're like, Oh, thanks. You just saved me 20 minutes of work. I'm like, thanks. You saved me 20 minutes of work. We're good. <laughs> okay. So that's what, we, that's typically just accept it, whatever. They're going to do a description of the mark. Fine. Whatever. Um, sometimes they do it by email. Sometimes if they're, I don't know why, they will actually give a formal office action. You have to respond in writing. I much prefer when examiners just call me up and I'll just take care of it on the spot. Done. I suppose they give a formal office action and you respond to this whole thing back and forth. No, they don't accept it. You can bill the client more, but hopefully you get enough work by just being honest and say, hey, I can do this thing in one phone call in six minutes, point one hours, and your clients will be happier for it and whatever. You keep your prices down and get more work that way. That's sort of my philosophy. I have enough work by not playing billing games like that. Okay, uh, next one, total home protection. This one is for total home protection, meaning the goods are for total home protection. Um, so this was another one, mark description and identification of services. So now we bring in those two issues from the prior ones, showing that you can get multiple issues at once. This again was an examiner's amendment. When you see it says examiner's amendment, it probably means because the examiner called me and we worked it out over the phone, or it was an office action and I called the examiner. Sometimes I'm addicted to email. So ah, I have eight emails. Ah, I was down to inbox zero. Yesterday, I was down to inbox zero. I hit inbox zero about once every six months, so I have no unread emails. Since I've been doing this uh, video talk, I'm up to eight, which is why you should always close everything else when you're doing something, because who can concentrate otherwise? I have a problem being addicted to email. I respond constantly. Anyway, where was I? Right. So examiner, you get an office action. It'll be something silly, like uh, mark description, identification of services. I'll call the examiner because I know they're in the office working. They're like, hi, you just issued this office action. They're like, what? You have six months to respond. I know. It's been five minutes already. <laughs> you know, I'm into my six months. I like, can we just take care of this mark description? Let's change it. Uh, identification is what you propose. Fine. Done. Do it. Then you get an examiner's amendment. And it happens less. I think examiners are more likely to call because I think attorneys are getting younger. I shouldn't say younger because we're not. We're getting older as time progresses. But more people are using email and more into this thing. My partner is in his 60s. And my partner, everything comes by mail, not by email, at least for patents. Trademarks now, everything's by email. But for patents, they come by mail, opens it up, looks at it. 
you know, takes <laughs> takes a day or two to report to the client. Me, I'm like, oh, there's my email. There it is. Right away, I'll send it forward this to the client. You know, look at it like same day. It used to be you get stuff in the mail, you get it three days later, you respond to the client another three days later. And if that, I've seen cases where attorneys, not my firm, not my partner, <laughs> definitely not, where attorneys report things to the clients two months after they get something, the one month left to file a response, or sometimes like a week before they have to file the response, I that gives me too much anxiety. I mean, as you can see by me having to respond right away, you know, must have some level of anxiety in my character in order to, to do this. But this is really, we can segue into this is actually more than just anecdotal stories. This is important. The number one reason attorneys get sued for malpractice, at least intellectual property attorneys, is missing deadlines. You can do a bad job, but you responded. It's a mediocre job. It's acceptable. That's probably not malpractice. But if you miss a deadline and you didn't report it to the client, that is a clear case of malpractice. You do not want to miss deadlines. So you docket these things. I use an auto docketing system. I use docketrack.com, free plug. I like them. Um, it automatically takes the emails from the patent office and the trademark office. It puts them in my docketing system. It puts the deadlines there. As long as you look at your docketing system, it's fine. It's all, it's all deadline for you and marked. Occasionally I find a few errors. They decided they, we're going to add a country field and the ones didn't have country fields didn't update. So you have to be vigilant of even these things to make sure. I don't think any system is foolproof. Um, I wasn't very happy when I noticed that. I'm like, hey guys, this didn't docket. Good thing I noticed this. Can you please check what other cases haven't been docketed? Because whatever, you know, I have backups. My invoice system says them automated. Reminders if they haven't paid and so forth. So they'll have notices, but can't have too many fail safes. Use Dropbox to store my files. One day Dropbox decided to delete all my files. I had to recover them. Thankfully, I had backups elsewhere in addition to them having 30-day revision history and whatever and so forth. And I keep offline backups because you don't know what's going to fail. Before that, I had my file server with two different hard disks in it. I didn't realize both of them failed. So I lost a night of sleep recovering from what I could from one hard disk, what I could from the other, what I could from the backup. I was able to recover everything. So now I keep Dropbox, I keep whatever other cloud backup on top of that. I don't want to give away all my places where my files are, and in addition to a backup on my own local file server. So hopefully, you know, if someone... Uh, internet goes gets destroyed because it runs out of electrons i'll still have my local stuff okay junk sluggers next one this one was a disclaimer and supplemental register so we're just going to keep adding more and more things to the pie so this one disclaimer why because junk sluggers was about moving junk so we had to disclaim junk because it was descriptive of an ingredient, quality, characteristic, function, feature, purpose of the applicant's goods and services, and thus is an unregistrable component of the mark. So a disclaimer is for things which can't be registered. So you can use these terms. People put like established 1988 or company or LLC at the end or .com. These things generally are not registrable, so you have to disclaim them. What a disclaimer means is not that it's not in the mark anymore, which is an often thing which clients confuse. Oh, I have to take that on the mark. No, it's still in there. It's still for purposes of infringement, for purposes of likelihood of confusion, um, which again, we'll get to later, of comparing marks to each other. If you have a, um, a, 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 um, a disclaimer in there, it means it has lesser weight, but it still has weight. It's still in the mark. Someone is still confusing by using that, but only by using it together with the rest of the mark. So if they said we're junk haulers, they're not confusing with junk sluggers. But if they said we're junk slugger baseball bats, we can make an argument the goods are different, but maybe they break them to throw away, whatever. Um, in that sort of case, it is an issue. So we went ahead and we disclaimed that, and I'm sorry, this was not supplemental, this was primary register. Um, had it been junk haulers, then it probably would have been supplemental register at best. It's probably generic, might not even be registrable. Generic, not registrable, descriptive, supplemental, um, arbitrary, fanciful, or suggestive. That's where you can get on the primary register. 
All right, moving on to the next one, Full Blue 365. This is a different one. I, this is the first one I ever saw in my life with this. We registered this for blueberries, and they said, is this a varietal cultivar name? I didn't really know what that meant. I kind of had an idea. Google it, look it up, look up the statute in the TMAP, the Trademark Manual of Prosecution, figure it out, ask the client. The client hopefully is finding blueberries, knows what a cultivar name is. It's not. We respond, it's not. Here's the response. It's not. The answer to both questions is no. Let's move on. Okay. Street Life Entertainment. This is another example of uh, description of goods. Didn't, the examiner didn't like my description. I put interviews, music, current events. So we amend it. Um, spe a specimen of use, I believe. Um, the issue on this one was... I don't remember, but uh, entity designation, we had, uh, if you put LLC, they want to say limited liability corporation. It's a silly thing. If you put corporation, no, that's incorrect. Well, technically it's correct. LLC is a type of corporation. Fine. Select LLC or corporation. Select the right one. Uh, amending the goods and services because, again, this was free form to put it in and they wanted something else. Al Imam. Now we get to translations. Um, this trademark, Al-Imam, was for, I don't remember what it was for, probably some kind of food. Um, Al-Imam, this was a little ridiculous to see here. English translation of Al-Imam is the Imam. It kind of reminds me of, there's a great Saturday Night Live sketch with Chris Farley, and Chris Farley's sitting there dressed up in this like pink flamingo custom thing, going like this, and he says, I am El Nino, I am the weather, I am Spanish for, and he thinks about it, really says, no, it is, the Nino. So that's kind of like what they require sometimes. So it's Al Imam is the Imam. Saturday, that was the, the best. Chris Farley, David Spade, Adam Sandler, those were the good years of Saturday Night Live. It's gotten good again, thanks to Donald Trump. And for whatever people want to say about Donald Trump, late night comedy is good again. He's given us that. So, whatever. All right. Al Imam, as I talk about a trademark for Al Imam and, you know, whatever, his bands. But whatever. Hopefully, in, you know, we'll look back at this. My grandkids will be watching this and be like, what is my grandfather talking about? Because whatever, I don't know, whatever. Donald Trump is president right now. That's just, just weird. We're in a Back to the Future Part 2 alternative timeline. There's no other way to explain it. It's just, how does that happen? <laughs> Woo! All right, anyway, I could go off on that for a while, but I'll, I'll stop because Amazon and Donald Trump are two topics I could pontificate for, for way too long. All right. Al Imam is the mark is I Imam. We put that translation fine. We put it in. Um, typically, if you don't put in a translation, I think the examiner missed it. They require a fifty dollar fee because you didn't put in the translation. So I think the examiner missed it and didn't make me do it because this is pretty silly. The first code is eight zero six. The first code is eight zero six. University of Don't Be Stupid, the next one. I actually have this certificate right here for you to see. So uh, this is proof. I got trademarks for a client for University of Don't Be Stupid. So this was ornamental refusal. So this comes when your goods aren't enough. So th this was bumper stickers for University of Don't Be Stupid. So in the bumper stickers, they went and said, the trademark office went and said, hey, that's not enough. That's a slogan. You also see this if you submit clothing and it's just like a thing on a t-shirt. If it said, don't be stupid on a t-shirt and try to register that, they'll refuse that. That's not enough. The way to get around these issues when the goods and services are not enough, well, first of all, try and do it when you file the trademark. In this case, I couldn't or didn't or I, I don't know what. Um, the uh, it is or I knew it ahead of time we planned to do this I don't, I don't remember but point being you need to show a bunch of different products so if you want to register don't be stupid in clothing which you can't it's infringing but you know something like that then you what you need to do is you need to file um, with a bunch of different pictures so you might show don't be stupid on the shirt don't be stupid on the hat don't be stupid on the pants uh, that sort of thing and now it'll be registered because it's across a line of them or different types of shirt, a sweatshirt, and so forth. It's the same thing. You might show this on a bunch of different bumper stickers and th that sort of thing. 
So when you and in this case we weren't able to do that because I'm looking at the certificate. We amended to the supplemental register. So again, you don't get full damages if someone infringes, but it's still a registration. And in five years of selling bumper stickers with University of Don't Be Stupid, then you could get it on the primary because University of Don't Be Stupid is in itself not descriptive. It, it's a it's a I don't know what you call that, an arbitrary name for bumper stickers. I don't know it means bumper sticker, but it's just I haven't shown enough use because it's only on a one-off product. So they'll say that doesn't function as a trademark, as a source of goods. It's just your slogan on a bumper sticker. Same thing with this one was another variation of University of Don't Be Stupid. So after five years of use, not five years of filing, but five years of use, you can use it. So supposing his first use here is... is um, 2016, let, let's suppose it, it's, right now it's, you know what, I'm going to plan for the future. Suppose it's, well, the law might change. But assuming the law hasn't changed, supposing it's 2030 and you're filing this trademark and the person has been in business since 2025, now, even if it was something that would have been on the supplemental, you can say five years of use, now I can get it on the primary, section 2F, based on use for five years. Okay, let's keep going. Let's move on now to Joseph Edigui. I forgot how to pronounce his name. Edigui. This one is an interesting one. Um, this one, we first... Joseph Edigui, I had never heard of. There is a... Was a Joseph Edigui who is a fashion designer for women's clothing. He is Moroccan. I have a client whose name is Joseph Edigui, who is also Moroccan. And they happen to have the same name. And we filed this for clothing as well. And we got a rejection saying false connection. False connection with this other Joseph Edit GUI. I called the examiner, spoke to him. By the way, this is now that we're getting into the more sophisticated rejections. It is a good idea to talk to examiners. They are much more receptive when you talk to them. You're friendly. They're actually pretty normal, relaxed people usually, especially trademark examiners. Patent examiners is a different topic. Patent examiners are all over the place. Trademark examiners usually speak English well. Uh, it's the first language. They're, they're attorneys, so they've gone through law school. And they have, uh, whatever, pretty low-stress jobs as far as I can tell. Um, and you call them up and talk to them about it, and they're usually friendly. They're usually helpful. They'll help you out. Um, seems like it's probably a decent place to work, judging on, you know, how happy the people sound on the phone in general. Uh, but, and so we called up the examiner, explained to them the issue, and I had him, I had my Joseph Edigui sign a consent statement and say, this is me, this is my, I don't think we submitted a driver's license, I saw his driver's license, because I was, you know, whatever, <laughs> he sent it to me, and we said, hey, there's a different Joseph Edigui, and in fact, that Joseph Edigui, I don't, I'm not sure he's so famous. So here you can see my response. Um, I'm not sure how well it's showing up in the screenshot, but you can always look it up at the trademark office, but looking up this mark. And we, we said, hey, that other Joseph Edigui, he died 12 years ago. The examiner's argument was, well, he's got a Wikipedia page. Isn't that famous enough? He didn't say it like that. He was actually very polite. Um, and so my counter argument is, well, Joseph Smagorinsky has a Wikipedia page. Do you know who Joseph Smagorinsky is? Probably not. Maybe. I don't know. If you, if you knew who he is before I tell you, then please email me. He is a distant, thir thir well, distant third cousin. He is a third cousin of mine who was like the, the founder of the, one of the first leaders of the National whatever Weather Service or something and is like the father of modern weather. And I know this because I do some genealogy research and this is how I found him and found his son who put his genealogical information, he's like a third cousin of mine, he's a professor in some university, I forget, somewhere in this Tennessee or something, South Carolina, and I found him and was able to connect and do my genealogy. So that's not an argument someone has a Wikipedia page, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that, that was his, that was what he had shown. So, you know, we overcame this, and I overcame this by arguing how many different people have biographies and in fashion designers. I found on websites, look, here's 7,000 top fashion designers. He is nowhere th there. You see Ralph Lauren Lipschitz on top and so forth. That's his real name. And, and so forth. And all these different people. And, uh, you, you don't see, uh, you don't see that. Uh, and, and so we were able to over, overcome it. 
And in fact, there are Joseph stores today, they, they, which I didn't know about either. You know, what do I know? If you notice, I do a lot of fashion trademarks and nothing about fashion. If it's not sold at Costco or Amazon, I don't buy it. And you can see the contradiction. I hate Amazon when it comes to intellectual property, but I'm a huge customer on Amazon because they treat buyers great. They treat sellers like dirt. <laughs> anyway, so, um, so we were able to overcome it. And then the Joseph stores are, I don't know what they're doing, if they're filing in opposition to it. But I said, look, you guys don't have an argument. Like, you know, go ahead. You want to spend the money opposing this. You guys only use Joseph. There is four or however many other people who have Joseph in their name for clothing brands and so forth. So, you know, what's your argument? That you were once associated with a guy who you have, no one, you know, no, no one, whatever. You don't use that anywhere in your trade name. Okay, so next one is this nice symbol. This one is another specimen refusal. This The specimen was refused. Why? Because what we had submitted in the picture was this. This picture was a picture of jewelry with these uh, th this symbol on it. And the examiner said, well, look closely. You'll see that that symbol is not the exact same. That has, um, that, that doesn't have all of the intricacies of the one that you fit, you did. Spoke to the client. Client says, well, yeah, because we cast this into gold. And when you cast it into gold, that little, you can't get all the intricacies. So what do we do? We submitted this picture instead. This is a picture of actually my client standing behind her, 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 whatever, her desk at a, at a, what do you call it? Not a trade show at a, whatever, a jewelry show, craft fair, whatever it was. And there you can see that that logo is on top there in connection with her jewelry. And we use that to sort of get around the issue as I found another place where she's using that logo there. And the examiner said, okay, we, ex I'll, I'll accept that. And that was just the easier route than making the argument that, well, hey, this is the same thing. It's close enough. If you know, I might have had made that argument. It's the only place she used it, but I didn't have to do that. Um, further, when you have to submit a substitute specimen showing how you're using it, you cannot change the date. So, supposing I put there January first, two thousand twenty. That's when the first date was, and I only had the actual jewelry itself. I didn't have this other picture. Now you go and submit the new specimen. Well, I've just created it because I realized there's a problem. So I created this new specimen and used it. And now I submit this. Now that's a problem because it wasn't as use, use on the date I said it was. That's fraud on the, on the trademark office. You don't want to go there. You'll get, a, you'll quote, get away with it. But if the trademark is, is ever challenged and you have to prove that and you can't prove it, your client has a problem with fraud, which is another reason why I don't sign them. I have the client sign them because I don't want to have the malpractice because I signed the fraudulent statement. You said I had first-hand knowledge it was used for that date, whatever. So I would ask the client, I'd get it in writing. If I had to, if there's some reason I needed to sign, the client needed anonymity or something. But if you can avoid that, much better. All right, moving on to the next one. Oh, so just one more thing on that. If you, your specimen is not accepted, you can amend to say, if you filed it as currently in use, remember there's two ways to file a trademark is covered in part one, currently in use or intent to use. Suppose you filed as currently in use, specimens rejected, you need to have a new specimen and you can't use your earlier date, you can amend it to intent to use application and then file the new specimen with a new date to, to now bring it back to currently in use. So, All right, moving on to the next one. St a statement of uses can be a little tricky, they just have to be accurate. Um, the uh, one more point on statement of use actually is when you file a, a statement of use, it's written at least as early as, so supposing they first sale is January 1st, 2025, and now it's April 1st, 2025, I might put it as February 1st, 2025. Reason being, I don't want to have to rely on that one single sale they did on January 1st. So now I have two months of sale, one month or two months of sales we can rely on. And we can rely on a longer period of sales. Now, uh, it's, if it's challenged, there's more things that they can show. So having an earlier date is good, but whatever. You need to weigh, weigh your options. I, I don't want to tie the person down to that exact day. They lose the receipt in a fire or a double hard disk crash. Um, they might still have other receipts somewhere else. All right. 
SPD is the next one. Silent Party Debt. Never mind. Um, this one was another request for information and significance of wording and mark on drawings differ on drawings and specimen. The reason why I put this one here, significance of wording, we've discussed that before. Does SPD mean anything? Um, mark drawings different specimen. This is another specimen refusal. Why? Because on the specimen here in the next slide, he wrote SPD-2. And down below, he had SPD-1 um, somewhere. And so the, the examiner said, you got to call this SPD-1 or SPD-2. You can't call this SPD because that's not how he's using it. So I went and argued, well, do you say back to my Windows 3.1 example, do you say Windows 3.1 needed its own trademark? It, they couldn't just have the trademark of Windows, which is a whole nother thing. Wow, this is crazy. I had a dream I met John Dvorak last night. I just remembered that. <laughs> anyway, John Dvorak testified in this case about the Windows trademark. There was a Windows trademark, which was Linux running Wine, basically, to emulate Windows. Um, I run Linux and I'm all on my computers. I am now totally Microsoft free, except for their fonts. You can't really get around their fonts. They're free and they're used everywhere, but whatever. I use Microsoft fonts. But otherwise, um, I'm a Google guy and I run Linux on everything. So their Windows trademark is a whole different story. Windows, whether it could even be maintained as a trademark, they instead gave Windows $20 million. I don't even know what happened. They became Linspire. I don't think they do anything now. Whatever. I'm, I, I run Linux Mint. I'm a Linux Mint fan. But anyway, but that's just wild that because I rem remembered this case and was talking about the Windows as a trademark and the version number isn't significant. It's here. SBD is significant. I remembered a dream that I had forgotten that I was met John Dvorak in a cab and I was talking to him. Really strange. Anyway, John Dvorak is like a writer. He writes for PC Magazine and stuff and had testified in this case as, a, as an expert about the Windows, w Windows trademark should not be trademarked because Windows has been used by Xerox and all sorts of other companies to refer to generically now as a window on a, um, in a, uh, open on a computer as, as one program is open, like not full screen in a computer or what have you. All right, Marion Warren Eyewear. So this one, we had filed Merriam Warren Eyewear, and you'll see here on the specimen, it just says Merriam Warren. So what do we do? Oops, we amended. That was what they gave me later. So what did we do? We took out the uh, eyewear, and they let us do that because they said, hey, eyewear is was disclaimed anyway. You know, big deal. Merriam Warren is the, th is, is, is the schniz. That's what matters. This was also a fake name. So... We had to say that Marion Warren does not represent the name of a living individual, just as in Joseph Edigui, we had to specify he does. Re it, 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 he is the name of a living individual. Uh, moving on to the next one, Bright Bod, another specimen problem. Um, why? Because we had submitted this picture where you can sign up for this Bright Bod. Uh, website. It was the sign up screen, and the examiner said, "No, that's not enough." you had submitted for uh, social networking, social networking health services. That's not enough to show their social networking. This is just a sign-up page. Fine. It depends on the examiner. Sometimes they'll allow that, sometimes not. And you can see this looks like a screenshot of my client's uh, computer. You can see that he is running the Google Chrome browser. He also has VLC installed, and unfortunately, he's using Windows like most of you are, but um, Linux is a snitch. You can switch to it now. It's so much easier to use, but you still kind of have to know how to play with the uh, command lines and like doing stuff like that, but whatever. Just because it takes you 10 minutes to install a piece of software, it takes me three hours, whatever. It's still worth it. Okay, so here, I've just now given in the next slide we're going to jump into likelihood of confusion now. This is really the major topic and what we're going to end with and what probably most of you really came here for. Well, that and CLE credits and that and my humor, you know, it's, I'm, I'm, come on, I'm, I'm more interesting to watch than most CLE classes. You, you got to give me that at least. Okay. I'm also very humble. 
Okay, so refusal of base of likelihood of confusion, mistake, or deception. This is MPEP, uh, sorry, TMEP. MPEP is um, patents. TMEP is the trademark manual of procedure. 1207 is likely to confusion. This is your friend. Basically, read it, quote it, follow it whenever you do a response to likelihood of confusion. Everything is in here. It's very well done. They go through a host of different issues. So I'm going to run through this quickly before we get into actual cases. Likelihood of confusion is is a ridiculous part step. It's like 13 part test, which my law school professor, I think this was Michael Frisia who said this, um, good guy. He uh, said when when your test has more than three uh, three parts to it, there is no test. When you need 13 part test of similarity of the marks, there is no test. Likelihood of confusion is basically Consumer sees product A, consumer sees product B. Am I going to think they come from the same source? Now, crazy example that, we'll just jump to this. I filed a trade, I'm sorry, my client, <laughs> without me, whenever clients do things without you, it's usually more money for you later. When they mess up, you have to try and fix their problem. He filed Sir, Ch Sir Charles Gourmet Products, and he filed this for snack foods. Someone else had Sir Charles beer or malt beer. I don't think malt beer is even beer. Whatever it is. We have Zima, non-alcoholic beer. What? Why? All right, just have a soda. All right, whatever. Um, anyway, so what's it talking about? Sir Charles. So there is actually case law to say, and it was like an Anheuser-Busch uh, restaurant and an Anheuser-Busch beer. That's not confusingly similar. It's case law on that very point. So we are they able to cite that and say that's not confusingly similar. So it depends. Do you consider those people are going to be confused? If you go and say the one of the most famous trademarks in the world is Coca-Cola. They could sell anything under that name and they'd probably make some money. Coca-Cola steak? I don't know, there's Trump steak. Didn't, no, never mind. Okay, Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola might be able to do it, but Coca-Cola is so recognized, you can't file Coca-Cola anything. It's going to be confusing because it's a famous mark. Unless it's a famous mark, now we have to look. How close is close? How close is the name? If, if we compare um, one of the examples, Marion Warren Eyewear, suppose someone file, files Ferian Gorin Eyewear. Gorin is another third cousin, name of a third cousin over there. Um, it means threshing floor in Aramaic, but whatever, that doesn't matter. Um, so is that too close? Maybe, maybe not, probably not. They probably won't find it. Maybe there'll, there'll be an opposition, probably not. But Marion Warren, and suppose there's Marion Warner. That's probably too close. What about Marion Wormwood? That was from, oh, what's that book? Um, ah, Danny DeVito made a movie out of, Matilda. From Matilda. My kids all like the Matilda book. So maybe that's not too close. So how close is close? And this is what you argue. So, the, and this depends on, on a bunch of factors. So they list here the DuPont factors, how famous is the mark and so forth. Similar and dissimilar in the marks in their appearance, sound, connotation, commercial impression. This is where translation can come into play. If you're filing a mark with a translation, you might go and say, that translation is not uh, is not too is uh, not too close. So you might have a translation where there's no there's no direct translation. It'd be like it means something like unity, brotherhood, and togetherness. Ubuntu, name of a Linux distribution. How I remember this, I think that's basically what Ubuntu means in Swahili or something. Um, so in such a case, you might put the English translation is brotherhood because you see there's another one for unity which is the name of a just realize is the name of a uh uh interface that's run in ubuntu which is god awful but whatever is beside the point um that's why i switched to linux mint for the two of you who run linux who are watching this any case so point being you might put a different translation to avoid that problem you might say or it might mean something like this it means one of these 18 words to try and not have that problem but anyway all of these factors of channels of commerce how close are the marks 
and that type of thing, relatedness of the goods and services. If they're comp- if one is comp- is a computer operating system for Ubuntu, and the other one is a um, little girl's clothing line, probably not the same buyers. Maybe they are. I don't, I don't buy my daughter's clothing. My wife does. So if she bought Ubuntu clothing, I'm not going to think it's the same company, even if it said Ubuntu on the clothing line. So that sort of thing. So the goods and services don't need to be identical. It's just a likelihood of confusion, which is another way of saying we don't know there is confusion. If there is actual confusion, that's evidence that you can't. But there's a likelihood of confusion. How likely are people to be confused? Well, I'll argue one way, you argue another way. Um, usually, as long as you can make good coherent arguments, trademark office is pretty good. And I'll, I'm going to then now show you examples of how you make such arguments. So, oh, and the, before we do that, 1207.01a4, page 8, no per se rule. They say clearly there's no per se rule. You might want to include that to say that there is no cl- clear rule. So you can try and weasel out of this. Like, who are you to say, trademark examiner, that this is? It's not a clear rule. Here's plenty of reasons why not. But you got to make sure to find the reasons why not. Expansions of trade, what they might go into, to other things. Uh, similarity in appearance. Another, arguments you can often make is suppose you have a logo, they have a logo. Suppose their 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 name is I don't know Wormwood Diner and your your Wormwood Dine In. First of all, Diner is going to be disclaimed. Dine In is probably disclaimed. Wormwood isn't. But I'll say, hey, that's enough. Even though it's disclaimed, it's still part of the mark. That still gives a different connotation slightly. Or their Diner on Restaurant, some different connotation. That probably won't work because they're Wormwood and you're Wormwood. But suppose they have a logo. Suppose theirs looks like the McDonald's logo and yours looks like the Bennigan's logo. I don't know if Bennigan's is still in business, but I've been keeping kosher for 17 years. So I haven't been, don't know if those restaurants are still around or not. But in any case, um, th- then you might make the argument. Those logos look totally different. Theirs is green, ours is yellow, and theirs is a, ours has a big W, and theirs, I just, McDonald's turned it over. Theirs is a, no big anything, and theirs is a cursive font, ours is a nice straight font, that sort of thing. Those are the arguments you can make. So here, moving on to the next one. Cakewalk Indian Bakery and Cafe. This one, whatever, there was a delay. I think the client, had his mark went abandoned. I refiled it. The reason why I picked this one is I love being able to do this. So this was rejected in view of another cakewalk. But that cakewalk in turn, I don't remember, but I'll give you any eventuality. It was either rejected because... Um, of something else because theirs was too close to a third mark that wasn't close to ours, which could happen because maybe theirs was theirs included uh, delivery service and there was another delivery service called uh, Chalk Walk and theirs was rejected and so they didn't bother responding. Or it could be they had a registration and their registration was, was five years ago. Now they're up for renewal. Trademarks renewed between fifth and sixth year and before every tenth year. So it was up for renewal, and shoot, we got rejected in view of this. Sometimes you can just wait it out. And you can wait this out for a long time, because suppose I get rejected January 1st, 2020. Now my response deadline is July 1st, 2020. Uh Uh-oh, their mark is still going. So I respond July 1st, 2020, and I just say, it's not confusing, here's a silly reason why. Now examiner might take two months to get to it. July, August, now up to September 1st. Final rejection, September 1st, 2020. Six months, now until March 2021. I have just bought myself, in that scenario, 14 months to now respond to the trademark office. And in that 14 months, normally that's bad, final rejection, you can't really make new arguments. You Now you prepare for appeal. Uh, but in that 14 months, maybe that other trademark has gone abandoned. So, for example, that prior trademark, it had a registration date of January 1st, 2016. Now, it has to be renewed January 1st, 2021. It has a six-month grace period of, okay, my math isn't going to work out here, until July. And they get two months after that before they, it's actually marked abandoned until the trademark office says it's abandoned. That would take them to September 2021. I bought myself to March 2021. I'm close. 
maybe they won't maybe they won't do it. In that case I call out the examiner. I say, examiner, look, they haven't filed it to be on the deadline, they're within the grace period, they're in the whatever. Can you suspend my mark? Now when they suspend it, it could be suspended indefinitely. So if you can get the examiner to suspend your mark, you've bought yourself seemingly infinite amount of time. If they renew their mark, your SOL as they say, no good, you can't do it, which means sorry out of luck. Okay, and uh, now you can it, it, now you're you're no good. But in this case, client was unhappy. Shoot, I've been using this before them. What you know, the whole thing. Ah, I thought of something, and you can buy them extra time. All right, next we're going to move on to um, mini mini. Here is is a case where you got to forget it. We registered mini mini for shoes. There was mini mini mass. For shoes, to, this is a case where I'm giving you an example where it was just too close. So I, we, I would have tried to make an argument and say client didn't pay the money. I probably didn't really tell them it was worth paying the money. But mini mini is the whole mark. There's his shoes. There's was footwear, which is like shoes. In such a case where it's the same goods, it's basically the same mark, there's not too much you can do. You're done. All right, next one, Brystar Illusion. This is actually, there were two marks like this. Brystar Illusion, this is a good one where we had a rejection, we're able to overcome it. It was rejected in the view of Diamond Illusions, both were for jewelry. Examiner said, um, basically, Illusion for jewelry. And the examiner had a point insofar as there were maybe, I, may, I don't even think there were other marks for Illusion. Illusion for jewelry, this was it. But we made the argument, you can't ignore that because what happens is, and this is from TMAP 1207, you cannot dissect a mark and examine part of it. You cannot dissect the wording and not examine the logo, the graphics on it. You cannot dissect one word of a mark and say this is compared and not the other. So Bright Star Illusion and Diamond Illusion, well, um, oh, okay. The examiner's argument here well, no, it was the other way. Because if, the, if it was the other way, they might have argued, well, diamond is generic and illusions is generic. I'm sorry, they did. Diamond is generic. Diamond was disclaimed in the prior mark. So the examiner's argument was, well, look at illusion. That's what matters more. Illusion matters more because illusion is the, uh, is, is, is the, main, is the main part. The, 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 unfortunately, English doesn't have a good word for this. It's ikar in Hebrew or ikar in Arabic. I have Arab-speaking clients, so sometimes we do comparisons. And uh, if you speak Hebrew or Arabic, you know what that word means. It's the, the main part of the mark. They said is illusions, and you have illusion. And I said, well, that's a backwards argument, because examine my mark, where the main part of the argument is not illusion, it's brystar. What's a brystar? English, I, English, the illusion is the common word. Brystar is the incommon, is the uncommon word. Brystar is therefore, since it is more uh, r ridiculous, arbitrary word, that's what a person's going to know. They're going to say, hey, that's the Brystar jewelry. They're not going to say that's the illusion jewelry. Who's going to say that? On diamond illusions, maybe they would. So that that was my argument here. Now you can see my arguments. And applicant respectfully disagrees. <coughs> I don't dispute the closeness of goods because there's nothing to argue there. You know, polite conciliatory to the examiner because he works for the government. If you fight the government, you you know what they they it doesn't hurt them really if they if they if they keep rejecting you. So the only way is is just be cordial with them. You want to have big mean fancy arguments. That's for cease and desist letters. That is for hopefully maybe the next talk that I give. And cease and desist letters, you do puffing and all that sort of thing. Here just. Give the facts. I find if you're honest, you show the facts, that's where you win. Don't make arguments that aren't there, don't make sense. I, you know, I think people see through horse excrement. The second code is 168. The second code is 168. Um, so we, we said the close to the scope, but... In terms of, uh, but here, the term is compared. Illusion instead of Brister is diluted, so it's not a problem. So 
there, we'd say there's others that are in 14 for that. And now here, the legal test from 1207.01b3, commercial impression and dilution. And we talk about how many other marks are there for that? What's the commercial impression? What are per people going to see? Even though illusion is a diamond was disclaimed, people are going to see that. That's the first word. It's just as important as illusion. So, and we say, here's a test. If either of these two prongs are met and just load up this, to find this case of the trademark office and you can just copy this and whatever. This is a good template to use. And we talk about the Citigroup case where they compared Capital One Bank to Capital and Citibank and so forth, that those weren't problems. And we talk about the marks in their entireties can face significant different commercial impressions or the matter common in the marks is not likely perceived as distinguishing source because it's merely descriptive or diluted. And we make these arguments and then basically you just plug in the words, plug it in and argue uh, how close are they to, to, to each other. And then another one, this was star illusion. I had the same thing, same client. I said star illusion is one word, diamond illusions is two, it's different, the star, whatever. We made the same sort of arguments. And here, here's another one. This one's a little harder. This one is still pending at the time of my speaking. Um, acoustics VR. The examiner went, this one I like it just because of the, uh, the argumentation involved, I suppose. It's very logical, methodical argumentation. You have to be creative, but at the same, this is basically intellectual property law, patents and trademarks. You, trademarks not as much, but when you get rejections, yes. You have to be logical, methodical, and creative. You have to be good at writing, you have to be good at math, and you, you have to be good at synthesizing the two things. That's what intellectual property law is. It's synthesizing the uh, cut and dry with the creative. It's, it's, it's very much both left brain and right brain. Um, I was a science major and comparative literature minor. And so, you know, I think I ended up suited for this type of thing. Um, so uh, again, we had acoustics VR over here and it was rejected in view of two different marks, Ivation acoustics and VR. So that's interesting. So I'm acoustics VR, it's rejected in the view of VR, and it's rejected in the view of Ivation, where, where uh, of Ivation acoustics. Okay, so here we are. Basically, the way we've done is done, done like this. Here's acoustics VR. Sorry, I don't have a prop. And now we've said acoustics, we're going to reject the view of Ivation acoustics, and, and the VR, reject the view of VR. It's kind of weird. So I have to argue both points. You have to argue both of them. Does v, is VR confusingly similar to acoustics VR? And is Ivation acoustics extremely si confusingly similar to acoustics VR? So we t take both of them individually. And here's my argument on the next slide. And basically, we've done the same thing. Here you'll see I have the same legal test there. And I like to start with, I mean, there's different styles. Some people put whole legal briefs. They put 10, 15 page documents. I've done that before too. And they cite case law up the wazoo. Um, I've done that as well. I found it's just as effective just to lay out the arguments without all the fluff and whatever, the case law around it that no one's going to read anyway. Cite the case, cite, you can cite case law. It's just, you don't have to do, go too crazy. And here you'll see on page two, basically what I've done is I have, here's everything that has acoustic that's related to speakers. And I said, okay, you found something that says acoustics, true, but I found acoustic-x, and that sounds so similar. And besides, the trademark office, remember I said before, it doesn't really matter if it's spelled with an S or an X. It sounds the same. Examiner, now you're arguing the other way because you're arguing on the side of rejection, you're arguing, oh, it matters, it didn't, it's sort of implicit, that this one has the X in it. Well, look at all these other ones. Here's acoustic, acoustic tools, Austin acoustic, Revex acoustics, pure acoustics, acoustic, crystal acoustics, YG acoustics, acoustic labs, SP acoustics, liquid acoustics, fulcrum acoustic, Vista acoustics, acoustic power acoustic, acoustic research, all for speakers, and you're telling me VR acoustics is a problem? No, obviously not. And then I did the same thing with the VR. You're going to tell me VR is a problem? That's so diluted. You know, the, the, there's other ones where people have added YG or SB and they were allowed. 
You know, why, why is that a problem? And what are you ignoring Ivation for? Ivation is the primary thing there again. So we have Comp VR, VR3, VR Glass, VR Vibration Research, VR46, Gref VR Studio, Samsung Gear VR, or VR Robot. And basically, I've taken all of these and I said, look, there's so many VRs, there's so many acoustics, nobody has an acoustics VR, which is more or less what I told the client when he wanted this trademark and he wanted just to, to do a variation. I want to say what? It's confidential. But... And we worked out doing acoustics VR because we thought, hey, this isn't going to be a problem. And we went through all of these. And when you submit such a response, you notice there's a ton of attachments here because you have to submit copies of each and every one of the certificates. Not only did that, I submitted the search results. and like, look how many come up. I search uh, all live marks that have acoustics anywhere in them in class nine and their first speaker. And that's... Look, that's even in that limited search, I get so many. So I'm basically saying, it's so diluted. You're right. Had we just gotten acoustics and we just gotten VR, maybe you have an argument. But you can't say acoustics VR is a problem for either one of those individually. And so that was our argument. Um, and Sir Charles Gourmet Products is the next one. I went over that one already, basically. And we this one was close. This one was not easy. Spoke to the examiner, spoke to him on the phone, talked to him about it and found that case law where restaurants are different, got it through, and so forth. And let's end here. That's the last one for the day. Again, if you have questions, contact me. You can find my contact information on my website, patentlawny.com. Thank you for watching, and um, that is all.